Good morning, everyone, and lovely to see you in the chat. Um, my name is James Sambrook, and it's so nice to uh, to see you all. Um, I started writing down where people were were checking in from. Some of the names I had no idea uh, what they what they were. Um, but, uh, but we've got people from Silverstone, from Geneva, from uh, Oxford, uh, Dundee. This is amazing. Um, before we get cracking uh, in the chat function you'll see there's a little blue drop down that says uh, hosts and panelists. Change that to everyone, and then everyone can see where you're typing in from. Um, it is a pretty gross morning outside, uh, certainly here in the Midlands. Uh, so let us know where you're watching from, and if the sun is shining where you are and it's warm, tell us about it. Like Make us feel better about what is a very dreary UK at the moment. Um, but despite the weather, uh, I feel really good about today's session uh, because... Our guest this morning uh, is Wendy Melville, um, who has COVID. Uh, fortunately, you're safe. We're all online. Um, or is just recovering from COVID. Um, so, you know, props to uh, to Wendy for, for turning up for this one today. Um, Wendy is a uh, fractional B2B marketing director, and she's got 20 plus years in tech marketing. So lots and lots of experience. Um, but one of the things I love most about Wendy is she's a member of our community. So She's someone you would often see typing away in the in the chat here, uh, giving feedback and, and getting involved. Um, and so she's here today to, to give back to the community. And that is the spirit of community. And that that giving mindset is what ties so many of you lovely lot together. Um, and there's a saying that Joe and I quite often use, which is a, a rising tide lifts all boats. And that is that sits right at the heart of what we do. Um, so yeah, really, really great to have Wendy here today. And her talk is gonna be uh, about focus. Uh, it's something I, I really struggle with. And uh, certainly those that will know me will know that. Uh, and I know a lot of you will be the same, uh, but you may also work with people who lack a strategic focus as well. Uh, and so we're gonna have a presentation um, and then we're gonna have the Q and A afterwards in the same way. Um, we're going to take questions from the Q&A rather than the chat if you've not been to one of our webinars before. Um, so if you put your questions in the Q&A and then if you vote for the ones that you really like, those questions, we'll try and answer those ones first and you can upvote them. Um, the final part of uh, my introduction is where we get to talk about some of the friends uh, and businesses who support this community and keep the sessions free for you. Uh, and today I wanted to mention... Uh, Braze. Braze uh, have been supporting us all year um, and I was looking at their, they're a, um, a tech platform uh, or customer engagement platform they call themselves and it struck me uh, that they deliver so many things that as marketers we measure ourselves on um, and they have a really cool thing on their website that says use cases which I don't think a lot of people do and it listed in there boost productivity um, like we all want to be that's why we're here today right um, optimize onboarding, like making it easier to get customers on board, increasing engagement, reducing churn, uh, improve acquisition. And, and sometimes I think focusing on areas like reducing churn can actually have the largest impact on our business. So um, it's a really cool tool and uh, I'd, I'd really love it if you went and check them out. Uh, I'll put a link in the in the follow-up email. And um, also big thanks to our other sponsors. So we've got Clavio, Storyblock, Impression, Exclaimer, Cambridge Marketing College and Redgate Software, who are all wonderful folk. Uh, and as I say, we'll send a reminder email afterwards. And if you could go and give them a little high five and a thank you, then that would that would mean the world to us. That is my introduction done, my kind of standard morning waffle. Uh, you're not here for me. You're here to hear the gold from uh, from Wendy. Uh, so, Wendy, I'm going to pass over to you and then we'll have a catch up after your presentation and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get going with some Q&A after that. Brilliant, hi everyone, um, great to, to see you. I'm Wendy and I work as a freelance marketer, um, a fractional marketing director for different companies, helping them define their marketing strategy and how to execute on it. This is very weird for me. I'm normally on the other side of the marketing meetup webinars and I can't tell you how useful they've been to me over the years. So thank you to James and Joe. Like, honestly, I've learned so much on the other side and it's kind of scary being on this side of the screen for once. So when Joe put the call out on the Marketing Meetup Facebook group asking which topics we'd like to see covered in this series, 
I commented that one of the biggest challenges for me was keeping focus, whether that's because I have 101 different things happening at any one time and I'm trying to prioritize, or if it's because my client or my boss is changing direction once again and trying to switch focus onto the next shiny thing. Um, focus for me was one of the biggest challenges and it resonated with more than a few others on the group, which, um, oh, by the way, if you're not a member of the Facebook Marketing Meetup group, please do join. Um, so yeah, a few people said that sounds like a really good topic and, and here we are. So there's four areas really I wanted to cover off today. The first one being not all focus is good. I, I can't tell you how many times I've got lost down a rabbit hole. Being hugely focused, yes, but focused on the wrong things. Um, and it was definitely not being partic particularly productive. So good and bad focus, that's the first bit. Then I wanted to share with you a few tips on staying focused, whether that's trying to keep your marketing activity focused, which is probably what I spend more of my time doing in the actual marketing, which is trying to keep your bosses or your clients focused. Um, so to anyone whose boss has come out with something similar to this classic, which was, I was listening to that Diary of a CEO podcast yesterday. We should do that. Let's start a podcast. Um, you, can you do that? And we'll put it out in the next newsletter. Can you get that ready? And so this section might resonate with you if you've ever had comments like that from, um, from the bosses. And then finally, there's a few tips on keeping yourself focused and how to navigate your way through the noise. Right, so let's go. So focus, and um, personally, I'm a list writer. And in an effort to stay on track and stay focused, I still put all of my tasks down on a to-do list and I love the disproportionate amount of joy that I get from ticking each item off during the day. Um, that was sometimes great for my productivity, but not always great if I was choosing the wrong items to get through just so I could be seen as being productive and ticking more items off and um, to give myself that sense of achievement. Over the years, I've had to learn how to be strict with myself to distinguish between good and bad focus, because sometimes I could get really, really focused but that's not very helpful when it's on something that was contributing nothing to the strategic direction that we're trying to take the business. Um, so I've had to develop some skills and cheat codes for keeping um, myself and my non-marketing bosses focused on the strategy that we'd agreed on, um, especially in smaller businesses where the entire business strategy was often set by one individual. So if they decided on a change of direction or a change of priority, everything could change overnight. Um, so I mentioned my love of ticking off my to-do list and this works for me, but only because I've gotten better at making sure the list is in the right order. Being able to distinguish between good focus, the strategic kind of focus and bad focus, kind of like that shallow distracting focus is vital to the success of any of your marketing efforts. So here's how I learned how to spot which is which. The good focus, so strategic focus, it's always part of a bigger picture and it plays its own part in moving you towards the company or the marketing long-term goals. And, and if it doesn't, then, then why are you doing it? Um, if you can't see that dotted line between what you're doing and the marketing or the business objective you're working towards, chances are it's a distraction. Um, and I would please, please check out the goal setting session that was on a few weeks ago with Joe Royce, um, because that will really help you nail your goal setting. That was so good. I got so many tips on that one. So good focus, it's based on data rather than your gut feeling or the latest trends. So ask yourself, why are you focusing all your efforts here on this campaign, on this project, on this launch, rather than something else? If the answer comes from, because I know it will do X, because it's based on data, great, you're on the right track. Is it consistent? Now that doesn't mean you can't be flexible or responsive, but good focus has a consistent approach. It's kind of like an iteration, it optimizes rather than just jumping from one thing to the next. Good focus is also really realistic and it's based on available resources. It's about making sure you get the most significant potential return or the impact for the time, money or talent you're investing. Um, you'll never get kind of like a Barbie style coverage from a startup budget. 
it it's not the best use of your focus and it can feel pretty futile um so bad focus or shiny distractions as <laughs> otherwise known as is very reactive this is kind of like jumping onto the latest trend platform or tool without really considering how it fits into your broader strategy um we've all been there when someone says something like oh oh my daughter said we should be on tiktok or we should start using ai it can write white papers really fast we should do that both actual quotes by the way from people in my marketing career to date um Try not to be reactive. If you're only focusing on the latest thing, question question why. Um, bad focus is also usually based on isolated decisions, kind of made in silos without consideration as to how it fits into the wider strategy. It can be a bit selfish, um, and I've got to hold my hand up here. I'm guilty of this one. Selecting projects based on personal preference, what you like doing, what's fun to work on or even what will make you look good rather than what's best for the plan, what's best for the company. Um, bad focus is really short term and it's not sustainable. It ignores the data. And worst of all, and I think everyone will recognize this, it's swayed by loud voices. So based on either the loudest stakeholder, internal or external, rather than a collective informed strategy of like where we should focus next. So luckily I've got four tips to help you kind of discern like strategic paths from shiny distractions. So first one, top tip, go back to your core objectives and sanity check everything you're planning. Make sure that it aligns with that path that you set out at the start of the year. And if it doesn't, it's probably a distraction. Like how often do we actually go back and check our tactics against the strategy that we wrote out earlier? Um, also use a decision framework. There's having a set criteria as to how you look at new opportunities and where to work and what to work on can really help in discerning like, what is the strategic value there? Um, th there's all different types of frameworks that you can go depending on the scenario. Um, also having really clear kind of like OKRs. So having a clear performance indicator will help you measure how effective it is. The whole, you can't manage what you can't measure. It's cheesy, but it's so true. Um, if you can work out how effective something is towards contributing to your strategy, you can very, very quickly discern its value. Um, and also allocate an experimental budget or that classic contingency line in your budget. Yes, you want to stick to the plan, but innovation is important too. Allow a little percentage of your budget to test new ideas. And this way you can test and learn and experiment with a fixed budget without significantly diverting your primary focus from your kind of core objectives. Um, next one is how do you keep your marketing focused? So Gareth Turner, again, I'm just going to do shout outs to the amazing lineup that we've had earlier in the season. Um, Gareth Turner did a session early on in the season on how to write a killer brief. And he mentioned this red thread analogy that connects your brief to the business need and having the business objective in mind, as well as the end user in mind, when when you start your project. Well, I'm going to totally steal his red thread analogy and apply it here too. So as marketers, we're so often pushed into focusing only on the tactics. We need more leads. We need more campaigns. We need more outputs. But how often do we check back um, to our strategy doc or our marketing objectives to make sure that we're still moving in the right direction? How often do we step back and make sure that red thread's still there, that our marketing activity, whether it be a campaign, an event, a new landing page, how do we check it against the company value prop and our core messaging? It's so important to check that that red thread is still connected. And it's the only way to ensure everything we're doing and outputting is helping move the right needle in the right direction. Otherwise, we just become really, really busy um, but potentially run the risk of being busy fools. So, I mean, do your companies even have that defined value prop and core messaging doc? And if they do, is it one that you think everyone in the company, not just marketing, lives and breathes? Or is it one of those docs that's saved in a PowerPoint deck, buried a few folders deep in your shared drive that kind of like gets looked at once every blue moon? I really, really recommend take a step back now and then and just sense check 
that that red thread is still connecting all you do and all the tactics that you're busy delivering and that they're, they're still serving you and they're still helping you move in the right strategic direction that one that you originally set out when you built your plan because it's so so easy to lose sight of this as we get busier and busier and we're all in kind of like head down our sort of mode of just getting shit done it's um you know go back and just check that red thread connection to all of the tactical stuff that you're doing you know is is it still serving you now i've got a disclaimer here because i've had some amazing 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 bosses over the years they've mentored me they've guided me they've really helped shape me into the marketer i am today and i'll be forever grateful to them for the time they took to kind of like give freely and to get me get my career to where it is now that being said <laughs> <laughs> I've also had a few other types of bosses over the years, and I've observed a few personality types that lead different marketing teams too. So you might recognize a few of these bosses that I'm about to mention. Um, there's the butterfly boss. This is the one that jumps from one great idea to the next, but never actually settles anywhere for too long. There's a magpie boss the one who's focused only on the newest, shiniest, most exciting thing um, so that everything else is forgotten. All of the other projects that you're working on are suddenly less important. There's also what I like to call the, I used to do all the marketing boss. Now these are often found in small and fast growing businesses. Um, and they often have a problem, let's say, letting go of the marketing decisions. And despite asking for a strategic marketing manager, or a head of marketing, someone to come in to take them to the next level, they struggle to let go of the marketing decisions and just end up frustrating the hell out of you by issuing tasks to be completed rather than letting you steer the direction of the, the strategy. We've also got the micromanager boss. I've had a few of these over the years um, and they share some of the traits with that I used to do it all boss. But a micromanager wants and needs to be involved in everything, every decision, every proof, every order, every pound spent. Um, and then finally, there's the marketing is just the colouring in department boss. And these are the ones that don't see the, the true strategic value that marketing brings to the business and thinks that all we do is make an occasional social post, maybe knock out an advert every now and then. Um, and learning how to keep these more difficult bosses focused on your strategic true north can be really tough. And learning how to say no, maybe that's not the best idea, is also a real skill because they receive it in a very different way. Um, and my advice is if saying no feels too difficult at times, learn how not to say yes, which is different. And it may sound a bit back to front, but sometimes just saying you'll consider their suggestion, consider their ideas, shows that you're respecting their perspective. Then it gives you time for you to explain your reservations. And it's a slightly softer approach, that it's not a no, but it's also not a yes, you're not committing. It can help prevent conflict and still kind of like keep that integrity of your marketing approach without having to be swayed by every single suggested diversion along the path. All right, so let's get into, I've got some, for each type of these bosses, the best way to deal with each one and how to say no to each one as well, which again, over time served. I wish I'd known this a, a, a while ago. So the butterfly boss, and I think a few of my old team are on the call. I have to admit, I have a few of these traits. I get distracted very easily and I move from one project to the next. And I think that's why being a contractor and a fractional marketing director works so well for me because butterflies flip from one thing to the next. We want to do everything and be everywhere all at once. So what work, What can we do to keep the butterfly boss focused? Consistent reminders, honestly, circle back to the main objectives of the strategy and the goals. Consistent reminders, that's what we need. <laughs> visual dashboards, butterflies tend to be quite visual. So any visual tracking tools that highlight progression of projects, this is a way to like subtly demonstrate that while new ideas are welcome and great, existing initiatives are already underway. This is how close they are to completion. This is why tools like Trello and Monday.com are my friend, because 
it's very difficult for a butterfly boss to kind of add more to the pile when they can very visually see what's in the flow. Um, also, if you have a butterfly boss, structure every meeting you have with them. Structure will keep your meetings with specific agendas, specific questions you want answered, actions you need to go through, and it will help keep discussions aligned with the ongoing projects rather than going off, letting us go off on a tangent. Now, the best way to say no to a butterfly is something like, I love the enthusiasm behind this idea. Um, given our current projects, I think we should revisit this once we've seen the results from our current campaigns. And this will help ensure every idea gets the attention it deserves. It's not a no, it's uh, not right now. Because honestly, if your butterfly boss is anything like me, they'll be on to the next thing by the time that review period comes up. And you can pull them back and go, right, let's review the ideas. What's aligning with our strategy? What's going to help us move that needle? Is that red thread of this activity connected to the direction we want to go in? And it will help keep butterflies like myself focused. The, the next type of boss is the, I used to do all the marketing boss. Now, these are really, really common, like I said, in small or growing businesses. Um, for any of you on the call that were the first marketing hire in your teams, you'll recognize this boss. I had one boss who shall remain nameless, who absolutely loved marketing, used to describe themselves as a dangerous amateur. And they hired a marketing team because they knew the business needed to get to the next level. But they really struggled to let go of what they thought was the fun bit of marketing, the kind of the ideation, the concept creation. And we had a few near misses. One being when they tried to get the entire sales team in fancy dresses, cowboys and cowgirls to man the exhibition stand at our biggest trade show and to help make us stand out. Um, not sure that being seen as the cowboys of the industry was really the direction that aligned with our strategy. Um, so what, helps with keeping this kind of boss focused acknowledge and collaborate so recognize their experience ask for their input at certain stages so they still feel like they're involved because they have will they have been there and they were doing it all by themselves not so long ago they will have some really valued info for you but involve them at the right stages educate them a bit use data and industry best practices to demonstrate why certain strategies or tactics might be more effective now you'll quite often find that these people were they've learned the hard way of how to do marketing they never kind of went through the process of kind of like the theory so help bring them on that journey help them understand why you're making the decisions you're making and it's not just going with your gut like they might be but it's actually founded in something more robust shall we say also set really clear roles and responsibilities. So if, if you define clear roles, everyone knows what's in their domain, like what their role is in the project. And that can really help set kind of the boundaries rather than them trying to get involved in everything. And how to say no to the, I used to do it all boss. I would phrase it something like, your experience in marketing has been invaluable but based on the current market and our existing strategy, it's not probably not the best time for this particular idea, but I'll definitely want to explore it our next review. Let's add it onto the Monday board for a review next cycle. It's kind of, again, trying to keep them focused. Again, <laughs> the source of today is trying to keep them focused and trying to keep them aligned to the strategy because they would have been part of setting that strategy. You need to remind them of that. You know keep them focused for the decisions that they made earlier in the process that they were behind that they believed in next and this one still gives me shudders because i've had oh, a few too many nightmares with a micromanager boss in the past i've had the micromanager that wanted to check the margins and title sizes of every presentation i ever created this was 10 plus years into my marketing career so i was like managing a team at this point and even though my slides were always generally okay, they would insist on that level of oversight for the entire year that I worked with them. Um, I've also had the micromanager that wanted a meeting before any, and I mean any decision was made. And this was like 18, 20 years into my career and I was running a global team. So again, it wasn't my first rodeo. It was 
I felt pretty competent that there were certain decisions that you know I could make. So how do you keep a micromanager boss focused? Um, you can't over communicate. Frequent updates, give them updates before they ask so they feel involved. You're off, you're oversharing, if you like. You need to build trust. So start with smaller tasks or projects where they already trust your judgment and gradually move them, baby steps, towards letting go of bigger responsibilities. Um, and unfortunately, you have to set boundaries, you know, respectfully communicate the negative impact that excessive oversight can have on team morale and productivity. Because honestly, a lot of the time, it's well-intentioned. It's just how they were taught to manage. They're not intentionally kind of like trying to ruin your day, honestly. And you just kind of hope that they're self-aware enough to take it on board. I'd say a few of the micromanagers I've had genuinely didn't know they were doing it. They thought they were being helpful. And when I pointed it out, they were full of apologies and they were like, oh God, I hate it when people do that to me. I thought you wanted the help. So, you know, it is it is fixable, it is changeable. So how do you say no to a micromanager? Um, I would phrase it somewhere like, I really appreciate your attention to detail. Uh, we've planned our current activities based on the research and analysis. You know, do you want to take a deep dive into why this might not align right now? Because I'll be happy to walk you through because they're very detail focused. So walking them through the, the detail and the thought process will, re will really help you here. Um, next, I think I've got one, two more, um, the magpie boss. Now, remember my comment about the boss who wanted to do a podcast after they listened to the diary of a CEO. Um, they're also the one that wanted to get on TikTok the following week because their daughter said it was good. Um, what can you do to keep them focused when there's always something shiny and new? There's a new tool, there's a new channel, there's a new some always a new something. Um, I would bring it back. So before jumping onto this shiny new idea, look at the cost benefit, provide a very brief, and it doesn't have to be an over, like you don't have to overanalyze this, but a brief overview of the resources and time already invested in your current projects and the potential returns. And then I costed out launching a new podcast, very like literally back of a fag packet style maths of the equipment, the setup to get a decent quality output, kind of like just a, a quick overview. And it quickly diverted the magpie back to our existing program. I was like, it's a great idea, but here's the realities of what it will mean to resources, costs, budget, what other projects will have to lose. It helps you if they're focused back again. Um, reporting is also a big one for the magpies. Periodically share successes and milestones of your ongoing campaigns to reinforce the value of, look what happens when you complete something from start to finish. Look what happens when you like to stay true to the focus and you let something run its course, rather than if you constantly change, you're never giving anything the chance to succeed, no matter how great the start of the project was. And if they really don't go for it, keep that test and learn focus. So remember that contingency or test budget line, I'd suggest you use that for kind of a, a magpie budget. <laughs> so a test and learn approach. So allow a small, test for a few new ideas while still focusing most of your resources on the primary strategy you can have this kind of like innovation budget to try new ideas now how do you say no to a magpie especially when they control the budget um i would go with something like oh that's a really exciting trend that you've identified even if they haven't identified it but they've brought it to your attention Let's evaluate it and see how it aligns with the current strategy. Perhaps we can run a side test to gauge its potential without diverting our main resources. That way, kind of you're appeasing them. It can be a side project. As long as they agree that it's not the priority, it's not the focus for the next quarter, it will allow you to continue along your strategic path, but also keeping in mind that you can try these new ideas. It's not that I'm saying don't try anything new seesaw innovation not at all it's about doing it in an intentional measured way and the last type of boss which unfortunately I've met one or two times is the 
I'd call them just the disrespectful boss, otherwise known as marketing is just the colouring in department boss. And I still cringe. Like, it makes my skin crawl when I hear things like, why is it taking so long? I could write a blog in 10 minutes. Like, or why does it take so long to organise an event? I could just book a room and get 100 people along with a few emails to my network. Best advice here, smile and breathe. Just smile and breathe <laughs> and get through and then like look at what will help keep them focused. It's continuously show them return on investment for marketing campaigns. It's demonstrate the value of marketing. I have got so good over the years at justifying marketing spend. It's analytics and tracking are your friends. And if you want to be taken serious, if you want to be able to justify more budget, if you want to be able to get kind of a seat at the table, track, it's all about tracking and measurement and being able to justify kind of your spend and your activity and the existence of your department. Once you can do that and you can do it in the language that your boss understands, you will be their favorite person and you'll get promoted. Honestly, <laughs> if you can show, if you're talking to someone that's sales focused or financially minded, show the ROI. Um, also educate them as to what goes into the planning and execution to help them understand like the depth and breadth of what marketing is. Um, a lot of times, that, I mean, I've been asked to like knock up a new website, you know, like how long is that gonna take? A couple of weeks for a full rebrand, new website, new pages, new structure, new SEO. Um, and in theory, in, in their head, it, well, they weren't trying to be disrespectful. It was, well, it's just a few words on a page. How difficult can it be? It's, and I had to walk them through the like, what's involved, like we could do that, but this is what you'll get as an output. If you want it done well, here's the steps you need to go through and here's why it's worth going through it well. So educate them on the process. Also collaborate with them, engage them in the project and let them see firsthand what actually goes into it, what goes into the planning, what goes into the execution, because a lot of it is that they don't understand. It's like the dark arts because we look like a calm swan on top of the water and things just happen. They think that it must be easy. They don't see kind of like the what goes what's going on below the surface. Um, and how do you say no to this sort of boss? Oh, this is a tricky one. So I would say along the lines of, I understand where you're coming from, um, but we've structured the current strategy on analytics and best practice. I'm always open to reviewing new opportunities, but if we activate this, it means we need to pause or cancel something else. So let's look at where we have the resources. It's, if they want to put more projects on, they need to take something off. And again, it's, making sure that the, whatever they're trying to squeeze in or add to the to-do list ties into your strategy. Is it gonna help move the needle? If your objective is to get more users or hit a number of users, is that launch gonna help you do that? Or actually, is that just gonna be about eyeballs? Is it gonna drive the KPI that you're looking to move the needle on? Um, and I'd say for all of these bosses that we've mentioned, communication is key. It's being able to communicate the information they need to make their decisions, try and understand their perspectives and their motivations, and it will allow you to kind of address their concerns and work together more easily. As soon as I stopped thinking of it as a them and us, and that, yeah, my boss is out to get me, they just don't care about marketing, they don't get it. And I changed my mindset into, actually, we all want the company to do well. We all are pulling in the same direction. And I could start changing my language and changing kind of like what I was trying to communicate. It, it changed the game, honestly, and it helped focus them on what they had already agreed at the start of the year when we were doing the planning, what was important. Now, the last bit, because I'm aware I've been chuttering on for half an hour. Uh, the last bit is on how to keep yourself focused. Now, talking about all my previous bosses felt like a bit of a therapy session. <laughs> it's given me a few flashbacks to, um, former roles but I just want to say I have had some amazing bosses and clients uh, and the ones who are difficult to manage tend to be the exception not the norm um, but I'd also dread to think how my team would describe my style because it's very easy to talk about the bosses that you've had in your history and how they've treated you um, and that's kind of how I've styled the bosses I don't want to be and I try and model the ones I had a great experience with 
Um, so yeah, this is, I need to take some of my own advice here as well, because I know I'm a bit of a butterfly at times, but I am working on that. It's a work in progress. So this is the last bit now. Um, you've learned how to keep your boss focused and how to get rid of the distractions of bad focus. How do you keep yourself focused? Because the to-do list is still a mile long. Everything needs doing like yesterday. How do you manage your time and your priorities effectively? And as I mentioned, I start my week with a list, love a list. Um, but then what I do is I use the, what's called the Eisenhower box, um, also known as like the urgent important matrix. This is great and it helps you prioritize your massive long to-do list by urgency and importance, sorting out the less important and less urgent tasks that you can either delegate or spend less time on. This is really, really helpful for me for when my to-do list is getting out of hand. I have to admit, I don't use it every week because some weeks I'm it's far more organized and calm, but for the weeks where it's like quarter end or it's all about to hit the fan, this really, when on Monday morning, this really helps me like focus my mind and prioritize. I also set aside 30 minutes at the start of each day for two minute jobs. And I use a two minute rule, which is if something takes less than two minutes to do, just get it done at the start of the day, get it done and off the list. And I get to cross lots of niggly little outstanding items off my to-do list. So it might be raise an invoice, chase a payment, RSVP to different invitations. And if you're like me and you risk finding yourself down a rabbit hole of two minute jobs that then leads to something else, set yourself an alarm, that 30 minute alarm, get as many two minute jobs out of the way as you can and then move on to the next task of the day. And it also kickstarts my productivity because I've got this huge sense of I'm going to have a really good day today. Look, I've got 13 ticks on my list already. Like, well done, Wendy. I also find it easier to, to batch tasks together. So where you group similar tasks together and can just get on with them. So, for example, scheduling all your social media posts for the week at once or designing multiple creatives in a single setting or sitting down and mapping out all of your nurture emails in one go. Um, again, because of how I'm a bit of a butterfly and my focus drips, if I can sit down and focus on one thing, I can knock it out and then move on to the next one. Um, there are loads of time management techniques and everyone is different. Um, there's one that I don't personally use, but I've heard great things about. Um, and for the interest of balance, I didn't want to just do the ones that work for me. I know lots of people who use the Pomodoro technique and this is working in blocks of focus time. So normally like 25 minutes followed by a five minute break and it's meant to enhance productivity and concentration. Others will use time blocking where you block out your calendar and just allocate specific blocks of time for certain activities or tasks. Um, this avoids multitasking or getting distracted by email pop-ups um, and gives you that dedicated focus for the for the hour, for the two hour block that you're like, no, I'm gonna lock myself away and just, just do this task. The Eisenhower box works for me, but everyone is different. So I would try out a few different ones and, and see what works for you. Um, then I also use tech tools to limit distractions. And there's some pretty good focus apps that can like block out distractions for you, like Freedom. Um, or Session is another one, that's a paid one, but that combines the Pomodoro style of time tracking while also blocking distractions for you as well. Um, personally, I'm old school and I just plug in my headphones and play loud concentration music. So again, there's no one size fits all. We're all wired slightly differently. Find the combo of kind of like tricks that works for you. Um, tech wise, I've already mentioned the planning tools. So like you've got monday.com, Trello, Asana, and they can help you organize and track your tasks um, or just go old school like Wendy and have it on a pad of paper. Um, these are also great for demonstrating your workload as well. And also if you're using the, the online tools, they can identify any bottlenecks in your team's resourcing. So you can help your team stay focused as well. And finally, I'd say my last tip is is keep learning. Like the, I did not get my skills of how to stay focused overnight. It was not a one and done thing. 
it's things that I've learned over time by joining marketing marketing communities like the marketing meetup joining discussions asking questions sharing challenges sometimes that external perspective can really help realign your focus because we can't see the wood for the trees and asking that kind of like external person for their view can really help but honestly I would say as a marketer the biggest challenges I faced especially as a freelancer and as a fractional marketer has been prioritization and yes I've just shared some very practical tips of you can use this matrix you can approach your boss in this way but the best piece of advice I've ever received so I can't take credit for it is is to be realistic and be kind to yourself Self-care is really important and setting boundaries. So things like clearly defining your working hours, making sure that you're taking breaks, giving yourself a bit, cutting yourself a bit of slack to avoid burnout, you know, inform colleagues or clients about your availability and protect your downtime. Because if you don't, you won't be able to keep focus when you're at work, if you don't have that time where you don't have to focus on anything and you can just unwind or you can focus on non-work things. So biggest tip, and again, it wasn't one that I came up with, it was something that you know a, a colleague shared, was you've got to apply your own life mask first <laughs> before you can kind of like be great and super productive at work. You need to look after yourself as well. So I would say, yeah, self-care, look after them, you know, look after yourself and give yourself a break. It, it's tough out there. You know, we're all doing the best we can, but we're only human. So, yeah, protect protect your downtime, and that is that is us. I hope that was useful. So, if there's any questions at all, well, you know, you fire away, that. and I'll do what I can. That was absolutely brilliant. I honestly, you've just <laughs> I'm keeping an eye on the on the chat function, which is on fire today. But you've just delivered a therapy session for most of our community it's so funny just watching people like i'm like writing a bunch of on my on my uh remarkable notepad for those of you looking for focus and productivity um zoe put uh that she i'm like kind of crying with laughter sometimes when you know zoe was asked to be uh more strategic in the marketing and she just put well where's the corporate strategy and then that shut them up really quickly it just like Everybody feels seen today. You've done a wonderful job at both delivering something very relatable, um, but also some some great practical uh, practical tips. Um, we've got uh, we've got about fifteen minutes left, um, and I was going to ask you about your decision frameworks. I wonder I wonder whether we actually pick up some of the questions in the Q and A, and you could maybe share some examples that I can I can put in the email afterwards if that's useful trying to think of like resources that we can give people because the, everyone is is loving this so much um yeah most definitely so the the frameworks that i i find useful and again there's loads out there if you have a look around is the good old trusty swat back from my work marketing 101 days which is really good on a basic level to go actually should we be going out and doing a campaign when this is a massive weakness for us um surely we should focus on our strengths uh, you know, do, doing a traditional SWOT is really helpful. The other one is for get, getting your boss on board with the project and for like make, getting the decisions and getting the decisions to go through the whole project is using rapid scores. So that's where it's, um, testing my memory now, recommend, agree, perform, input and decide, and you allocate stakeholders to each of those. So you might have a really broad group for those that are going to recommend a solution or recommend a course of action, but there's only two people that need to agree it. And that's the person paying the bill and the person that, you know, so you, so you decide at each stage, who are the recommenders? Who's going to agree? Who's going to actually do the task, which normally tends to be marketing? Who's going to input in the direction? And then who's going to make the ultimate decision, whether it's a live go live or not. And by having that rapid score, and that rapid framework, you can kind of have people feel involved, but they know the boundaries of their role, which is really, really helpful. And RICE is the other one. So we, at the start of the planning year, we would have all of the campaign ideas, all of the activities, and we'd assign a RICE score, which is 
what's its reach potential, what's its impact, um, how confident are we that it will work, and then what's the effort involved. So if it's a massively high rice score, you know that's going to be like a big epic project. If it's a relatively small rice score, and then you can rank it on, oh, actually, if the effort's relatively low, but the reach and the impact are high, that suddenly goes into the top left quadrant of your, we're going to do this sooner rather than later. Right. So again, depending on what your challenges are and what the scenario is, there's a few different frameworks that are really, really useful. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Wendy. Do you, do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can, uh, so people can oh, see your... Uh, yes, your as one well. second. Um, I think, you know, what, what I'll try and do is dig some of those frameworks out and we'll, we'll share those afterwards. There's people putting links actually in the um, in the chat, so I'll look Oh, at thank you. Um, we've got some we've got some questions. We've got a little bit of time to uh, to go through those. Um, the, the most upvoted one is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and I think it's a great question. Um, how would you approach finding and keeping your strategic focus when the company has no strategic goals or objectives? I've had this before, especially with some of the clients I've worked with. It's they want to, they just want to sell more. I'm like, that's not really a strategic objective is to make more money. It doesn't, that, that's not, so I always walk them back and go, almost like the, the what's their why kind of like go back to the corporate objectives what do they want to be known for what is their value prop what's the what are they delivering and what is success in three or five years going to look like for that business and it's different and it's not it's not a bad thing if they say success would look like we've sold the company and we've got an exit as founders because actually you can then build your marketing strategy to serve that need mm -hmm. and that would be a really successful marketing strategy it will because it's serving the corporate goal. If their corporate goal is to actually, I want to affect change in behavior because actually we're about driving a behavior change. It's not about how much money we make. We want to, to drive behavior change in this particular group of people, in this particular activity, then your whole marketing strategy will be focused on very, very different things. And it's really helping them define what, what their company exists for and what they're planning in the next three four years and unfortunately that i mean that's that's when you're moving from marketing to strategic marketing to corporate strategy and if you can help a business on that journey then you are becoming a real indispensable multi-skilled marketer so if you have an organization like that it might feel like a bit of a nightmare but actually that is a huge opportunity for you to get involved in helping direct a corporate strategy and that sounds like a dream nightmare while you're in it but actually from an experience point of view you could like make such a huge difference to that organization by helping apply the marketing principles for you know kpis and plans and how you track and measure but help them understand like what's their end goal and then you can work backwards to to support that yeah we had some um, we had some great advice from a uh, one of our previous guests a few weeks ago um, who was talking about it was a really simple thing but like going and making friends with people in different departments so actually like just going and and finding somebody in the accounts department and understanding what their challenges are what their goals are and and when you get that kind of holistic view of a business you start to understand what everybody needs and therefore you know the strategy can can kind of fit in with that so yeah that's um that's if you're not friends with your cfo or finance director Give them a secret Santa gift this year. Give them a Christmas card. <laughs> Start a conversation with them because I would say, depending what sector you're in, finance and risk and compliance and legal should be some of your best friends. And there's not a natural affinity between marketing and those departments. But if you can create one, life will be so much more rosy <laughs> for the marketing team moving yeah. forward if you can make friends with those departments. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we've got, we've got a question here. Uh, from another anonymous attendee um, that says, as a as a woman, uh, motivation and energy can massively drop at the particular times of the month. And working in a busy marketing environment, especially when managing a team, can seem difficult to maintain a fast-paced marketing world uh, and lead to procrastination. Do you have any practical tips to keep motivated and on task to avoid procrastination when your energy levels are low? say sometimes it's okay to have a 40% day 
you don't have to be at 100 percent every day and i would say that's not just for the for the women in the audience although we know which time of the month we're not having 100 percent days because we can map it out and we can plan our diaries accordingly accordingly but for for guys as well like we don't always have to be on top performance and it's okay to have 40 percent 30 percent days hell the last week having covid i've had a few five percent days <laughs> i was like you know what i'm contracting i need to get myself up and do some work but it's it comes back to that being kind for yourself. And if your expectation, nobody is at 100% all the time, it's not possible, then it's it's about balance. And you'll have some days where you're absolutely smashing it out of the park and you're like, I'm on fire. I've, I've, I've earned my money by 10.30. Yeah. You know, I like the value I've added today. And you don't give yourself credit for those days. You just beat yourself up for the days that you're on 40%. So I would say it's all about balance every day I do the same thing like I'm definitely like an evening person certainly if I'm editing videos like I'll quite happily just sit with my headphones and edit deep into the evening but like in the morning I can be up making up a tea and then take the dog for a walk and then get the kids to school and and then I'm like oh there's this there's this little video on Instagram that I haven't and, and you know before you know it, it's 11 o'clock and um yeah but but then you have to be you have to forgive yourself sometimes that actually that's part of the process and you know well that's my excuse anyway but um but yeah we there's can, a great scene a in mad men there's a great scene my favorite scene in mad men when the creatives are in the room and somebody complains that they're doing nothing and they're like they are they're being creative you need to have that period before you have the moment of inspiration before you have that kind of like moment of magic yeah and it's not all about always being 100 miles an hour and always outputting you know, you need to, part of the process is giving yourself that time to just stop and think and this and, like, and be. <laughs> this just continues the therapy session, Wendy. Like, are you <laughs> sure you're a marketer and not a therapist? Like, I, I think there's going to be people that are going to be uh, contacting you for, for more in-depth therapy. <laughs> um, Aurora uh, has said, uh, how to balance being productive and tackling your own uh tackling your own to do with briefing and supporting your team for them to do their own often prioritize the latter and end up not tackling my own i'm not sure you... it, it is and this is a challenge i had especially when you go from being the producer and kind of like the the doer and kind of like managing the output yourself to then leading and managing a team and i say leading and managing because it's different and um, leading and managing a team can take so much more time than the actual doing of the work and I would say it's a challenge you need to again if you are acting as a manager and a good manager then you don't have a hundred percent of the time to do the the stuff the tactics as well and you need to understand that if you can perform support your team and they improve output by 20%. That's like five, 10 people improving 20% because you've enabled that. That is more than what you can do if you were just sat down doing the work the whole week. And it's focusing your efforts and going, actually, it's okay if I haven't written any copy this week. It's okay if I haven't delivered any stuff because your role has become to enable the team to, to be the rock stars, to to like move all of the obstacles out of their way so they can get it done. And the trick is getting your boss to acknowledge that because sometimes they want your level of output to remain super high as if you don't have anyone to manage and then to manage your team like you don't have any workload. Yeah. It's, so it's, it, it's a two-prong um, thing. It's definitely a journey. There was a comment from somebody earlier um, who very openly said like, I, you know, hands up, I used, to be a, I used to be a micromanager. And I think... You know, I think we all go through these stages in our careers. Of I remember when I first started having to manage people, and I, had, I was way too like stern on them. And you know, and then I realised that actually that that's not getting the best out of them. And then I was way too relaxed and just let them get away with like murder. And and you you go through these. You have to you have to be a bit rubbish sometimes to realise that you're you know the mistakes you make. You have to micromanage and then go. Oh, actually, that's not a good way. And you know, yeah. And people don't, there's very few organisations that will actually teach you how to be a manager. Mm. They assume that because you're good at, like I was a good product marketer, that doesn't mean I'm a good product marketing manager to run a team. 
Yeah. I was good at product marketing. Don't make me responsible for four other people because product marketing skills do not directly translate to <laughs> being a good people manager and leader. And yeah. it's something you need to learn along the way. And that's why, again, the being part of communities, the having that growth mindset and like being open to learning is key because none of us have got it right. We're all winging it to an extent. We're just slightly more confident and have a few more war wounds as we get further along the, the path exactly. of winging it. And Mark, Mark's it's kind of that and do no harm. <laughs> Mark's put in the comments, micromanagers anonymous. I think there's going to be a few of us in there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a journey. Um, we've got uh, we've got lots of anonymous people uh, today. Uh, the the next question is um, about how you build a strategic plan if you're reporting to someone who is not a process person at all jumps from one idea to the next very quickly and it's hard to get details cemented down i.e it takes multiple emails and calls to get something confirmed is there a is there a specific technique around around that or a type of email or um, i think for people like that you can't do it in an email um you need to almost like lock them in a room so you need to have a a strategy day or a strategy hour you know a strategy session and it's here's here's what we want to achieve here's like let's get again coming back to that kind of like the, the rapid all of the people that need to rec make the recommendations and then there's people that need to agree and if you can nail them down so you're not saying we're not going to do anything else but help them identify the top three priorities because that can become your guiding north star for the next six 12 months yeah and, and it will help and you remind them that it was them that set it it's you know that they helped set this it was their insight that got you to that it's kind of like stroking their ego a little bit but it's you know they helped create this got this north star that you're all moving towards and remind them how great it is and keep them focused on that it's the difficulty is is getting it done at the beginning is locking them in a room getting that meeting set up and getting them to agree because if they're anything like me, it's a butterfly and we'll go off and we'll be like, oh, but what about this? And and you have to bring them back to that strict agenda, have that agenda, have that structured session of here's the outputs, agree the outputs at the start. You know, by the end of this meeting, we're going to have these three things nailed. Yeah. And it takes practice. It does. It's not as it's a lot easier to say than it is to do. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think we can I think we've got to we'll squeeze one more question in because I think it's <laughs> it's really uh it's really valuable. Um and it's something that a lot of us will will come up against, and it's that balance between long term uh, investment in marketing and you know something short term like LinkedIn ads. Like if you've got a manager that is just focused on next week and what what how has that ad performed as opposed to like what's the what's the longer term strategic goal? Is there um, like how how do you manage those those sort of people? I love a funnel. I'm, I'm all about funnel marketing and it's kind of that red thread message. So you can you can measure the tactical success of campaigns while also measuring its impact towards moving people down the funnel or its impact in to kind of like the, the foundational strategic goal. And it, I think as long as it's all pulling in the same direction, it's when you have a LinkedIn campaign that's a bit of a vanity one, which is, oh, our competitors got 30,000 followers and we've only got 25,000 or they've got 3,000, we've got two and a half thousand. I want more followers. And they want, a, and, and it's like, that's not a strategic campaign. Unless your goal is to have more followers to achieve X, Y, Z, and it goes down, you follow that thread that it's all contributing towards pulling you in the right direction. It's, it's making sure that those tactical campaigns have that red thread through, that they are contributing and feeding up towards one of your strategic objectives. Yeah. And this is, well, when you set your team objectives as well, you know, is your content writer targeted and measured on the things that are going to move, move you towards the right direction in the same way that your events manager is? Because all of them should, all of their goals should stack up towards the marketing goals, which should stack up towards the, the corporate goals yeah. and and it's as long as you've got that red thread going from every activity up to something strategic then you're on the right path 
I wonder how many people are going to be uh, walking around with a piece of red string in their hand today. <laughs> I think there's going to be there's going to be quite a few. Um, well, I need to say thank you to Gareth because I totally stole his analogy <laughs> from the How to Write a Great Brief session. I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to steal that. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, Wendy, this is this has been one of my favourite sessions. Like just seeing how how much it, it lands with people um, is makes me realise just how important you know such a simple topic is um, because there's a lot of people that uh, feel seen today um so thank you so much for that and thank you everybody in the chat as well um it's been off the charts which is which is great um we've got a session next week uh with dana de gregorio i hope i said that right um who's the global director at mesh and she's going to be talking um mesh experience sorry and she's going to be talking about research which is something i am terrible at um but would love to be much better at and going right from beginner to to pro um, so I think that's going to be a, a wonderful session. Um, we'll have uh, all the links that we have uh, been talking about in the follow-up email, uh, which hopefully I'll get done today. And if you're in Liverpool, if anybody's in Liverpool, I'm heading up to Liverpool later today for a marketing meetup in person. Uh, we've still got a few before the end of the year. It'd be great if uh, if you wanted to come along to any of those. There's some, some tickets available. Um, but uh, apart from that, I think we're done. Uh, massive thank you to all. Hope the sun starts coming out and shining and uh, and you all have a lovely day. Catch you later, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, James. All right. Take care. Bye.